password on this computer. And we are recording. Okay, welcome. Um, my name is Bill Hendricks. I'm the Dean of Academic Life for the Bard Early Colleges at Bard High School Early College Manhattan. Uh, this is our second Dean's Hour at a Distance and it is our first live musical performance of the semester. Uh, it is also our first collaboration with Tone, the orchestra now. Um, I think today's performance couldn't be much more timely. It's a moment where our apartments and homes are feeling smaller and smaller. The walls are certainly closing in on me with three children and five Zoom schedules and tenuous plumbing and less than a thousand square feet. And I think it's nice to enlarge our world thanks to Bard College, particularly through art. Um, I wanna start by reminding us that we are much larger than our individual campuses. Uh, we're connected to a network of public Bard early colleges from Newark to New Orleans, from Hudson to Cleveland, from Manhattan to Queens. And we're also connected to a network of private Bard satellite programs around the world, from Al Kutz to Smolny to Simons Rock, the original Bard Early College. And we're also connected to Bard graduate programs, including some in New York City, that have brought us international affairs classes to take offsite, and summer museum internships, and even Dean's Hour speakers, such as next week's speaker, Peter Miller from the Bard Graduate Center, who will be speaking about Machiavelli next Tuesday. Uh, essentially, though, we're part of Bard Annandale and its extraordinary combination of artistic and academic programs, especially music programs. Bard is, of course, home to Leon Botstein, who is inarguably the most prominent and accomplished conductor college president in modern history. Uh, he's the leader of Bard College and has been for four decades. He's the founder of the Bard Early Colleges, and crucially, he's the founder of the Orchestra Now. Uh, and thanks to the Orchestra Now, or Tone, today, we will see our worlds expanded and inspired beyond our closing walls by art and artists who will perform live for you. For today's Dean's Hour, we have four musicians, Heiko Singer, Matt Ross, Victor Toth, and Regina Brady, playing cello, flute, clarinet, and oboe. We also have members of Tone staff who can answer questions, including Leonardo Jose Pineda Garcia, who graciously arranged for these performances. Um, after each performance, students will be able to ask questions of the musicians through the chat function. I hope today's presentation is of interest to the larger BSEC community as art for art's sake, and I hope it's particularly interesting for year one and year two students as they place works of literature in their cultural contexts. It's a chance to hear from working artists talking about how and why they play the music they do and to learn some salient features of that music. First up today will be Peko Singer playing a cello solo uh, the Allemand from D minor cello suite by Johann Sebastian Bach. So I will turn it over to Pecos at this time. Hi, everybody. Nice to see all of your little uh, faces there. I, I chose this piece to play because it's, it's one of my favorite movements from all of the six cello suites. Bach wrote six suites, and each suite has six movements, and this is one of my favorite from all of those. I, you know, started work on, on these pieces when I was in high school, and the, the second suite, which I'm going to play from, is in D minor, so it's sort of has a more somber, uh, emotional feel to it, and I think that I've been revisiting this suite a lot over the past several weeks, um, given the situation we're in in the world today, so this is the Alamon from the second cocktail suite in D minor. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
questions if anybody has any uh, questions about what I just played or anything else. Sure. So um, people can send questions to me through the chat function. Um, Pecos, can you tell us a little bit about the time period from which this piece is drawn? Um, what are some characteristics of it that we might be hearing in this piece that are emblematic of the Baroque? Sure. So this is um, sort of the early 18th century um, so early 1700s, and um, Bach is one of the first to write these these solo pieces for cello. Um, there were some earlier pieces written by Gabrielli, um, but this is a time when the instruments were in a lot of flux. And um, one important development that happened around this time is that the well, all the strings were made of gut. It was uh, around 1680 or 1690 when. Um, in Italy, the technology for winding gut strings with silver uh, was developed, and that allowed the lower strings of the cello to respond much more quickly and made it much more suitable as a solo instrument. So um, Bach is taking advantage of, of that. Um, but also his music is very um, polyphonic, meaning that there's sort of multiple musical lines going on at once, um, which is a little bit different than um, maybe the Italian sort of monody or the sung single voice style that, that was slightly before that in the late um, 17th uh, century. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a good um, example of sort of what we call like high Baroque playing, so sort of the, the most advanced type of writing that was going on at this time. Great. Uh, I'm going to ask people to mute themselves unless they're um answering uh, online just in terms of better acoustics. We have a question from the audience, which is, what was your process in interpreting this piece? When you were practicing, did you go over different ways of playing certain sections of the piece? I guess, how did you go about preparing this particular performance? Yeah, so Bach is um, very special to cellists because we have these six suites that are all really phenomenal pieces of music and it's sort of a text that we come back to over the many years that we that we play. Um, there are actually five different original texts of this piece, um, none of which are in Bach's original hand. So the, the manuscript that I reference mainly is the Anna Magdalena Bach, uh, which was written by Bach's, J.S. Bach's wife, Anna Magdalena, during his lifetime. But because there are so many different versions um, written down, things like the bowings and the articulations are, um, are really up to the interpretation of the artist. So a lot of times I listen to different recordings, especially um, for ideas uh, to, in, to change my interpretation. Um, and then I also reference the original manuscript um, and also some of the edited modern text. Okay, so this is a question from, uh one of my students of Latin American literature, but also a musician herself, Amal Biskin. How has your relationship with practicing changed since being in quarantine? Um, well, I've had a lot more time to practice. That's one thing. <laughs> um, I think it's also, it's in some ways it's made it more difficult to focus because I don't have clear objectives all the time because you know some of the, auditions that I was practicing for have been canceled and the concerts that I was preparing for have been canceled. Um, so it's really given me time to go back and, and look at music that I was interested in revisiting, such as this, this box suite, but also some etudes and studies to work on my technique in general. And one final question, thinking a little bit about periodization, how do you incorporate modern styles into your playing while also honoring Baroque technique? Yeah, and that's a really interesting and, and difficult question. Um, I, I studied for about a year and a half playing the Baroque cello, so with gut strings and holding the cello between my legs without the end pin and with the convex curved bow. And so I think that experience is um, really informative. Um, 
so a lot of times what I'm trying to do with the modern uh, equipment that I have is create the sounds that I um, create the sounds that I heard on gut strings and with the other bow simply just using these these, these different materials. Great, thank you. In the interest of moving along for time, we're going to move on to our second performer, um, Matt Ross, with a flute solo. And maybe, Matt, you could introduce the piece. All right, did that unmuting work? Am I, am I in the clear? <laughs> um, so I'm going to play the, the exposition from Mozart's first flute concerto in G major. Um, this is something that I learned in high school for my first undergraduate college editions, have used again for my graduate school editions, used for every single orchestra edition ever. So it's really important um, piece in the, the flute literature and it's always interesting every time I come back to see what I find. So enjoy. any questions out there? <laughs> uh, well, we had a simple question. Could you remind us about the artist and song you're playing? Just uh, the, the who, the form, the composer? Yeah, this, uh, this is the, the exposition of the first movement of Mozart's concerto in G major. Uh, he wrote two flute concertos. One of it was actually adapted from the oboe concerto. Um, this is not that one. Um, and the, just the exposition is sort of the initial statement of all the themes that will be used in the rest of the movement. If anyone's familiar with sonata form or anything like that, this is kind of your first introduction to the meat of the piece. And then everything else after that kind of follows the same or similar patterns to what have already been set up here with what I just played. Great. Um, what's the most challenging part about executing classical era pieces for you? Um, I think balancing the conservatism that a lot of people want to hear with uh, being overtly musical, especially in an audition setting where you don't really know what a committee is looking for or how conservative they really want you to be. Uh, so I think it's really just about finding some sort of interpretation and, and really playing it with conviction. Great. And I'm going to repeat the question from earlier. How is your relationship with Maybe how's your relationship with music changed during this time in quarantine? Um, you know, it's been really interesting. I, I kind of have been 
trying to keep my head down as much as possible and just sticking with the routine that I have had in place for the last, I don't know, year and a half or so. I have what I call the, the four pillars of wind playing and I focus on those things first uh, for the last however many months. And then beyond that, I work on whatever I have coming up. So in this case, if I don't really feel like playing anything else, if I'm feeling overwhelmed, which is a totally normal thing right now, um, I just make sure that I get my fundamental work done, do my technique work, all that kind of stuff. And if I feel like passing for the day, that's fine. If I feel like taking out some excerpts, that's fine too. I've been playing along with a lot of recordings and kind of revisiting scores of orchestra pieces just to keep myself entertained. So it's uh, it's more of do the fundamentals and then whatever else comes is great or not, and that's fine. And what do you miss most about musical experiences during this time in quarantine, particularly as a member of an orchestra? Yeah, I think just the experience of playing in an orchestra is something that can't be recreated, really. Um, it's just so, it's such a different skill set to be able to play off of other people and feel other people's energy and become inspired by what you're hearing around you. And uh, you could do that to a certain extent with some recordings, um, but it's certainly not the same as you being there doing it yourself. So I can't wait to get back into the chair and, and keep doing it. Great. I had a question about what you're thinking about while you're playing. So once a piece is embedded into your memory, does your mind wander? Or how does your relationship with the piece change once you've memorized it? Uh, I'm usually just thinking ahead and really trying, to, most, most of the time more than anything else, I've worked so much on something that I don't need to think about the notes so much. So I'm thinking about line, I'm thinking about voicing, thinking about maintaining an openness in my body in order to be able to execute the, the musical ideas that I want, um, and really just hoping for the best. <laughs> Great, and uh, the final question, how did you pick this particular piece? Um, uh, like I said, this is just a, a piece that has been, it, it's, it's arguably the most important most often requested piece for the flute. So what better time to take it out than now? Great, thanks so much. And we'll have time for follow-up questions with the earlier performers at the end, assuming time goes on, but let's move on now to Victor, who'll be playing on clarinet. And Victor, would you mind introducing your piece? Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here and having us today. So the piece that I'm going to play is uh, a section from Aaron Compland's clarinet concerto. Uh, I will play the cadenza, so you know I don't need accompaniment for that. So I figured that would be probably the best way for me uh, to present something. And the other reason why I chose this piece is because um, I've had, I, I've been lucky enough, and I've had the chance to perform this piece as a soloist with with, with this orchestra, with the orchestra now, a couple of years ago. And uh, it's always nice to come back to this piece because it brings me memories back um, from that time uh, just you know thinking about the rehearsals and concerts and how we how we got to the point where we actually performed this piece and and um, I thought it would be a good um, piece to play today for you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you. Let's make sure to mute people unless they're asking a question. I see some applause. Yes. Um, Victor, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what attracted you to this particular selection? Uh, well, I would say it's because this was probably the very, very first encounter for me to, to get acquainted with um, the style of jazz. Even though a lot of people don't like to call this piece a jazz piece, there's certainly a couple of elements that really resemble the, the style, uh, especially uh, in the section after this, which is with the orchestra and it's about the rhythm. Uh, but obviously, uh, you don't want to make it too jazzy because technically this is a classical concerto. Uh, so you just need to be a little careful with how much you add to it from jazz. Great. And we have another question from another student. Uh, Dira Nobrazov is also a musician. Uh, what form of playing appeals to you most? Do you consider yourself more of a soloist by nature or an ensemble player? Well, um, I like all of them. I, 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 I have to say that. So uh, as part of as an orchestra member, we mainly perform in groups uh, in an orchestra, but sometimes we have the chance to play chamber music. So um, one thing that I really noticed through my undergrad is that I really got close to chamber music um, and just experiencing when you find the right people who you really love playing with, that's, that's, an, that's another thing. And uh, I feel like I really needed to treasure that time because when once we get out of school, to the real world, um, we won't necessarily have the chance to play with the same people that we love all the time. So, so I really, I really appreciate that from my undergrad. And um, so the third, third part would be uh, playing as a soloist. Well, I, I really enjoy that. I really like. We had a, we had a concert in December with Tone, and we played at Jazz and Lincoln Center. Um, and I had a chance to play another piece with, with the orchestra and, and seeing it, how much the orchestra evolved from when I first played this piece with them a couple of years ago. And, you know, between the time from that and, and December, this past December, it, it was really rewarding to see that. So, so it's, it's, re, it's very different to play as a soloist because you have to take charge. So it's, uh, it's it's a very responsible job to do, but it's really really rewarding. And when you when you actually get to work with the musicians or with the people that you know and have been sur surrounded by for a longer time, that really really makes a difference for the better. This is sort of a general question, but uh, you mentioned your undergraduate studies. I'm wondering how your uh, academic studies have informed your playing as a musician, and how your work as a musician has informed your academic studies. Mm -hmm. Well. Um, so I did my undergrad here at Bard um, and then the Hudson. Um, so I had to do this double degree program. So I did music as my, mm. my mm. majors. Sorry, I'm gonna ask people to mute their phones um, so that we can hear the performer. Thank you. Oh. Go ahead, Victor. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, so... Um, you did your undergraduate at Bard. Yes, I did. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, so I did my undergraduate at Bard, and my second major was Italian studies. So um, I, I would say um, it helped in a sense that the main language of the operas um, is Italian. So, so and, and I put... I, I'm particularly a type of person who's really into operas. So I think um, when, I'm, when I perform a solo piece, for example, or I'm playing a solo section in the orchestra, uh, if the style fits, it really, really helps me thinking in words, even though I see notes in front of myself. But, but just, just having this um, opportunity to hear, to hear the words connected with, with, with music in operas. I think that that really, really helped me 
think in a different way where I'm actually trying to to sing with words but still without words. Wonderful. Um, there's some questions I want to get back to later on for everyone about playing solo versus playing in the orchestra and some of those differences, but I'll sort of open that to everyone at the end. But in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to our final performer, Regina, who'll be playing oboe for us. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. Um, hi, guys. So I'm going to be playing two of um, the six metamorphoses after Ovid by Benjamin Britten. Um, I'm going to play the first and the last. Um, and so the first uh, is, is titled Pan with the subtitle, who played upon the reed pipe, which was Syrinx, his beloved. And the final movement is entitled Arethusa with the subtitle, who flying from the love of Alpheus, the river god, was turned into a fountain.
Thank you. So there's a virtual applause button. Um, there's one question that came from Christy Powell, our student activities director, uh, coordinator, uh, which is, of course, is there a time for you all to play more? I think all of us would love to hear more from you. I wanted to point out this will not be our last interaction with the orchestra now. We would love to have you on campus in the fall when we are back uh, in real time, face to face. Um, one question from Mina Bachman was about practicing in this environment. A lot of our students are learning about residential college life and what it's like to manage your own time um, and balance out a work day without the imposition of a bell schedule. Have you found it harder? Uh, we'll start with you, Regina, but all of you can answer this question to keep a strict practice schedule under these circumstances um, of self-isolation. Is it easier to slack? Uh, have there been any advantages? Sure. So, so I, I, I like Victor, um, did a dual degree program during my undergrad and I went to Oberlin College, actually. Um, and so I think, you know, you're sort of forced, you know, it's like tri trial by, by fire, right? Like you, you sort of have to, excuse me, um, you have to like be able to, to keep yourself really strict scheduling wise because there's just so much work. And I think I got good at that pretty quickly. Um, and for me, you know, I'm inspired by all of my colleagues who have been able to stick to their practice schedules during quarantine. But, you know, I took a solid week off and sort of needed to take a little time to, to regroup. And we, um, you know, and I think that's totally valid. And I think it's important for all of us to, um, you know, we have so many outside pressures and, and things that we're preparing for that are not, you know, necessarily uh, things that we're choosing all the time. And so I think it's really important to make sure that we're taking the time right now to, to do things because we want to do them, not because they're, you know, what we're supposed to do. Or that kind of stuff. Great. I want to get a lot of people answer that, but I wanted to uh, ask you a question that a number of people in raising in different forms. This last piece is my understanding has a story behind it and sort of program music that has a story associated with it. Do you find it helpful or hurtful uh, for your interpretation of the story is already given to you, or would you prefer to come up with a story for a piece yourself? I, I'm sorry, I, you froze. Sure. Um, this piece, based on the titles, sounds like yeah. program music. Um, right. Could you talk a little bit about what it's like to, when a piece has a story associated with it and, and what sort of limitations are on your own interpretation? Sure, yeah. So this um, piece was written by Benjamin Britten, who is like a, a one of the uh, most prominent figures in classical music in, in England in the 20th century, um, but it is written uh, in response to the to Ovid's Metamorphoses, which um, was the Roman poet uh, Ovid's sort of magnum opus um, in the first century of the Common Era. Um, and so that was sort of this, this epic um, chronological telling of the creation of the earth through the death of Julius Caesar. Um, and, and it's sort of this, this in, incredibly long thing that doesn't really have form. But um, so as far as Britain's adaptation or response to that, um, uh, I think the, the, the word metamorphoses has, has sort of a dual meaning here. Um, a lot of these movements, including the last one that I played, sort of um, is a description of a, a small uh, metamorphosis in and of itself. So this Arethusa who flying from the love of Alpheus, the river god was turned into a fountain. Um, and yes, so as far as program music goes, it both provides sort of a framework um, or, or, or an idea for how one might approach music because, because the composer is saying, you know, uh, for this last movement, this is literally, you're depicting water, it's a fountain. Um, and so I think that that can be really helpful. And I think, I, you know, I don't think it's, you know, I can, I can imagine, um, you know, that, that on the complete other side of the spectrum, it could be sort of uh, inhibiting at times, but I can't, I can't really come up with, a, with an example of that for me. I think it's, it's usually, um, you know, entirely beneficial information, but. Great, thank you. Um, we have time for some more general questions people can ask of any of the different um, artists who perform. So I'm gonna open up the chat room to everyone so we can um, make them public. I did hope maybe to hear a little bit from everyone about 
uh, the orchestra now, why they chose the program, what they're doing in the program, what their role is in it. I think our students are vaguely aware of it. They know that Leon Bobstein is a conductor and a college president, but maybe you all could speak briefly about your connections to the orchestra now. Uh, why don't we start with you, Regina, since we have you on screen. <laughs> Um, so I'm actually finishing my, um, my tenure with the orchestra now. I'm, I'm just finishing my third year. Um, and I, I came to the orchestra after, not, not only just after my undergraduate um, studies, but I, I did a, a master's degree in, in oboe performance as well. Um, so, um, so this uh, master's in, in uh, curatorial studies um, and music um, is, is going to be my second master's degree. But um, I, I think what, what drew me to the program was not only um, the chance to, you know, work in a, you know, semi-professional, um, you know, orchestra environment and have the, um, have the opportunity to play music week after week with, with um, incredible colleagues, but also, um, that you know, we're sort of seeing the the tenuous environment um, that this world uh, is, you know, that the arts are are, are uh, experiencing in this world right now. And so, um, part of um, part of the orchestra now's uh, like fundamental goals is to sort of talk about and 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 come up with ways to make you know this western art form really relevant to um to a really different society in the united states than it was originally written for and, and sort of what that means great i'm wondering victor matt and pecos if you could also uh, give us a short response uh yeah i guess i'll go next i similar to uh GG, I had quite a bit of schooling before this. I actually recently finished my doctorate in cello at the University of Maryland. So um, I guess what drew me to this program uh, the most were really the performance opportunities, um, especially in New York City, you know, playing in, in such wonderful halls. Um, the first time we played in Carnegie Hall, I was just stunned by the acoustics you know the hall has a reputation obviously but I think it really lives up to it so I think for me that was one of the most important things but then also playing with all of the, the other great musicians in the orchestra is really just a pleasure um, and being able to play with the same musicians regularly because prior to that I was doing a lot of freelancing in the Washington DC area playing with different orchestras and um, it's nice to be able to, as Victor alluded to earlier, to play with the same musicians regularly and to really build something there that, that is worth sharing. And then lastly, the, the emphasis on uh, curation and the development of new ways of communicating with, uh, communicating with audiences is really important, um, as, as Gigi also alluded to. Great. Uh, Matt and Victor? Uh, yeah, I, I love Gigi and Pecos's answers. Unfortunately, mine is far more cerebral than theirs. <laughs> um, once I finished my master's, I was freelancing in New York City for a year, and it was just constant hustling, no time to actually practice, just to barely scrape by. And to be totally honest, it was horrible. Um, had I put more time in, it might not have ended up being so bad. But I was looking for somewhere that I could make enough money to support myself and really just hunker down and focus on my playing. And I do believe it worked. Um, I won a position in the Albany Symphony a couple months ago. I've been doing really, really well in uh, lots of other auditions since then and before then. Um, and I feel like my playing is leaps and bounds better than where it was prior to joining the program. And I think that part of it is being able to, like I said before, sit in the orchestra and do the job and really know what that feels like. And part of it was having financial freedom to do that at home as well and really have all my attention just right where it had to be. Great. Thank you. 
Victor? Um, so I agree with everything that's been said before and, and, and those are my reasons as well. The one thing uh, that I want to mention is that I just really wanted to try myself out under uh, a very intense rehearsal schedule um, before I joined the, the orchestra because we, we have like five, six rehearsals uh, per week and sometimes we have to change programs from week to week. So it's, it's a very sudden change. And I, I, I actually wanted to prove and, and just test, test myself that, that I, can, I can do this and, and, and to see if, if it would fit me. Great. Some people have individual questions about colleges you attended as undergraduates. I'm gonna share emails with those folks uh, after this rather than taking time for them now. We're running short on time and I wanted to, uh, Take advantage of the fact that we're all at home. We've just heard some wonderful pieces of music and hear from you each a suggestion of where we should go next. Uh, I have time and I have a streaming device at home. What should I go listen to this afternoon? We'll start with you, Victor, because we have you on screen and then maybe we could hear from Matt, Picos, and Gigi also. You mean, you mean a, a classical musical piece? The question is open. Oh. Um. But probably classical, given the context of our conversation. I would say Mahler's Second Symphony. It's it's um, it it was pretty relevant. Um, it's called the Resurrection. So it's, Mahler's it's, Second it's, Symphony. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely a longer piece. So so you, you will need like a like a half afternoon for that. So <laughs> thank you, um, Matt. Uh, yeah, I would say, uh, and I'm only saying this because we have all the time in the world right now. Um, I always love coming back to Strauss's opera, uh, De Rosenkavalier. It is absolutely perfect, except for the fact that it's four hours long. So if you want something a little shorter, just I would probably go to uh, Shostakovich Symphony. Just pick any one. They're the most colorful scores that you can imagine. Wonderful, uh, Pecos? Yeah, I was just looking up so I could give you the exact name. I, I was particularly inspired by listening to uh, a recording of the Bach D minor suite. It's on the Voices of Music YouTube channel, and it's a performance by Eva Leimenstuhl. And there's the complete suite there. Uh, the whole suite is only you know, maybe 20, 25 minutes, but I would recommend listening to the whole thing. Wonderful, and Gigi, you have the final word. Yeah, this is, I mean, such a, such an intense question, um, but, but I, I think, you know, given that I'm in uh, Britain's oboe world right now, I would, I would recommend uh, listening to the, the Fantasy Quartet, which is a, uh, you know, a piece of, of chamber music for oboe, violin, viola, and cello. It's, it's uh, much shorter than, the, the four hour long Rosen Cavalier, you know, about 15 minutes long, but, um, <laughs> but it's a, it's a really incredible piece and it's, and it's an early Britain piece and it, and it just shows uh, his maturity at such a young age, which is really cool. Wonderful. Thank you, Gigi, Victor, Matt, and Pecos. Thank you, Leonardo, for helping to arrange this. Thank you, Orchestra Now, for sharing your art and artists with us today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you and hearing you on campus soon and wish you the best. Take care, everybody. Thank you all.